Hey, welcome everyone to this SOAS Linguistics webinar. Our speaker today is Adrian um, Sakiwa, who is uh, working on a PhD in linguistics at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and is also a member of the indigenous group known as Zuni Pueblo. Uh, naturally, her research focuses on the Zuni language, Shiritma, uh, but as she has interest in various subdisciplines of linguistics, including language documentation and description, applied linguistics, language acquisition, sociocultural linguistics, language revitalization, and reclamation. The material she'll be sharing with us today is part of an article that's going to be published soon in language. So later this year, you'll have a chance to read the, the full version of this work in print. And today you'll get sort of a sneak preview of what's going to be uh, uh, in that aspect of Adrian's work and a chance to interact in the question and answer section. So Adrian, thank you for taking the time to prepare a presentation for us and share that, that work with us. And we look forward to hearing what you have to share. Uh, great, thank you, Joey. Um... Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, but how I'm going to start is, um, well, first, uh, by acknowledging where I am currently at and, you know, in a form of a land acknowledgement. So I am currently located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, so that is not the capital <laughs> of the state. It's about an hour south of Santa Fe, and it's also about like two and a half hours um, east of Zuni Pueblo, where my family is from. Um, so I want to acknowledge the, this New Mexico is Pueblo land <laughs> uh, around Albuquerque. It is close to the Sandia Pueblo, uh, a language, Tiwa language speakers, as well as the Santa Ana Pueblo, uh, Karas language speakers. Um, and I wanna show in just to, Give some points that my Zoom background is of the <laughs> International Balloon Fiesta that takes place in Albuquerque, usually every year um, in October. Uh, obviously, it didn't happen last year, but they were able to put it on this year at the beginning of the month. And in the background, you can see the balloons and some of Sandia Mountains. Um, so yeah, I wanted to start out with that. Um, I also want to. I guess begin by giving a little bit more introduction to myself as well. Uh, so as Joey mentioned, uh, well, my name is Adrian Sekua. I am a PhD <laughs> linguistics student at UC Santa Barbara. I, my tribal affiliation, um, I guess the one that I identify most with is with Zuni Pueblo uh, because that's how I was raised with my maternal family. Um, and I, so that does, my linguistic journey began with hearing or be, you know, knowing that another language other than English was spoken in the household. And also, you know, after taking kind of that intro <laughs> to linguistics course in undergrad, seeing how language shift is impacted my family um, and our language, uh, especially with the intergenerational language loss. So that kind of motivated me to begin my linguistics journey um, as someone who, who wanted to learn more about their language and wanted to be able to learn skills to be able to help either speak it myself or to help keep it um, spoken in the community. Um, these people I will, I refer to as language warriors. Um, so there might be some in the audience as well. Um, so I began my linguistics journey at the University of Arizona in their Native American Languages and Linguistics program, their NAMA program. Um, it's a, program for community members for um, who wanted to work on their own language, who wanted to learn various skills, not necessarily just linguistic skills, uh, and uh, analytical linguistic skills um, for their language work. So I, with that program, you start out with the, 
in, in the summer and you start out by attending the American Indian Language Development Institute, which is a 42 year old institute um, based out of the University of Arizona. Um, and it's an institute dedicated to providing critical training to strengthen efforts to revitalize and promote the use of indigenous languages across uh, generations. So within this program, you know, I started out with Aldi, you, um, they are heavily focused, as I said, on kind of language teaching, language pedagogy, and everyone there has to produce a, a language immersion lesson that they teach every teach um, at the ending of the kind of a closing program. So having that foundation of language pedagogy to that began, that was a part of my linguistics journey has been very foundational to how I approach language research um, and to working with communities as well. Um, so also as a part of my time at Arizona, I took a lot of classes in their language reading and culture program. Um, and now it's called the Teaching, Learning and Sociocultural uh, Studies program. Um, and it was there that I was, I'm gonna see if I can share a screen now. that I was exposed to these, to me, critical texts. Um, that has shaped my views as a researcher, as they emphasize that indigenous research involves and serves indigenous peoples. Um, so I emphasize or wanted to highlight these books or these authors, um, these texts in particular, um, starting with decolonizing methodologies. So professor, this is a very influential book that has been spread that globally is very popular. Um, first published in 1999, second edition in 2012. Uh, professor Smith is a Maori scholar from New Zealand. Um, the second one, uh, indigenous, methodolo ind indigenous methodologies by uh, Professor Kovac, who is a Plains Cree and Salto, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that one, uh, Salto First Nation scholar from Canada. Um, and the second one, um, indigenous research methodologies by uh, Professor Chalisa, who is a Bantu scholar from Botswana. Um, so I highlight and emphasize these texts, well, first, because these are indigenous women and as an indigenous woman myself, um, someone of role models <laughs> to me, Shiro's, if you would say. Um, so I include their relations and where they're from to, to highlight the global reach that their work has had on indigenous scholars like myself. Uh, but also by highlighting their global influence, I hope to show that these methods can also be applicable to diverse global contexts. Um, so, so kind of continuing on with, uh, with another aspect of my linguistics journey is, so as a language learner, I want, I still want to and want <laughs> wanted, wanted to and still want to learn more about the morphosyntax of Zuni, uh, the Zuni language, um, which is an isolate language and, and doesn't have a, a lot of documentation, especially current documentation. Um, and for me, I thought a field methods course was necessary to, can, to learn about like analyzing language structures and descriptive linguistics. Um, so there was, during my time at Arizona, there was a field methods course in the course catalog, um, but it wasn't offered during my time there. Um, I wasn't able to participate in a field methods course until after I entered the PhD program at UCSB. And it was after my first year um, that I went to the Linguistic Society of America Linguistic Inst Biennial Institute that they have on odd years at various US institutions. Um, so I took my first field methods course at the 2017 Institute in 
of Lexington, Kentucky. Um, and then kind of moved right into a year long field methods course that my department offers um, at UCSB. So a year long that's, we are on the quarter system. So three quarters, 30 weeks of field methods course, which is for my research is a long, a long course <laughs> to most, most courses are either just kind of a one semester. Um, yeah, not super, not the whole year for the most part, from what I found. Um, so also at this time <laughs> in 2017, I also became involved with a NSF, a National Science Foundation funded project um, titled Expanding Linguistic Science by Broadening Native American Participation. Uh, the co-PIs uh, on that grant are um, Dr. Wesley Leonard and Dr. Megan Lukanik, uh, both indigenous scholars themselves. Um, Dr. Lukanik at that time was my mentor and roommate, our housemate at UCSB. So it kind of it worked out in that sense. Um, and with Dr. Leonard, um, not too far from us um, in Riverside, California, we were based in uh, Santa Barbara at that time. So the goals of this project or, or was to, are still to kind of increase participation of indigenous peoples within the discipline and at the Linguistic Society of America annual meeting, um, developing and promoting decolonial strategies to better incorporate indigenous needs and values about language into linguistic science, um, and also creating a space for indigenous peoples to share information and knowledge. Um, so yeah, so beginning, be, becoming involved with that program or that, that um, grant effort or project, and then also taking the year long uh, field methods course kind of put me in two different spaces, <laughs> uh, head spaces in terms of um, research. Um, so, but with the field methods course, I felt that the Western approaches to research and collaboration are the norm for linguistic fieldwork training, uh, which motivated me to examine on a larger scale how students of linguistics are trained to conduct linguistic fieldwork. Um, and this examination is discussed in my upcoming paper, which uh, Joey mentioned at the beginning as well. And I will give a brief overview of that. Um, as I also mentioned, it's, it, it's slated to be published, but I believe in the December issue, and I think it will be open access. I will give that permission, I feel, <laughs> to ask. Um, so yeah, it's titled Reimagining the Current Practice of Field Linguistics Decolonial Considerations. In this examination, I so it's definitely just focused kind of has a US focus, I would say, um, especially when it comes to the universities that I look at. Um, how I approach this, this research is through a critical, critical discourse analysis lens um, in which I collected field, method, field methods course descriptions from course catalogs and also other texts from department websites uh, that, def, you know, that reflected the department's stance on language documentation and description and anglo linguistic field work. So um, in total, I looked at 59 programs and US universities. I also developed a survey using Google Forms. Um, and this was sent out and ministered to professors and instructors of field methods courses um, and produced a mixed method analysis in my paper. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of responses, but was able to get 21. Um, I also continued, you know, looking looking at texts, but through in in this text, these texts are filled linguistic volumes and handbooks. Um, I can't remember exactly. I think it's like nine that I have listed on here. But starting with Samarin in 1967, um, with I believe it's the most recent one that I, to my knowledge, um, in 2018 uh, by Meekins et al. So through this, I'm not going to go over through, you know, 
a lot of <laughs> what the paper says. Um, I'll give you the chance to read that all when it's out. But I mean, just to kind of share some of the major findings that this examination revealed. Um, is that there is a definitely within linguistic fields of training, there's a still heavy emphasis on traditional elicitation techniques for data collection. Um, collaboration is, is discussed in terms of producing language materials. Definitely language materials in the Boazian triad trilogy sense, the definite kind of that dictionary, grammar, and text. And also that there's a minimal reference to just kind of collaboration in general and in, in, in any of the text on this courses, department websites, the handbooks, et cetera. Um, another major critical finding um, was a lack of in-depth attention to ethical concerns. Um, and I, my when I guess my focus or when I thought about ethical concerns was definitely kind of human factors. Um, and this, once again, mentioned discussing community or collaborative relationship building, which is key to working with indigenous peoples, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> and also that speakers are heavily viewed as simply sources of information as a means to an end um, when it comes to linguistic filter training. Okay, so I'm going to transition now to, to discussing the International uh, Decade of Indigenous Languages objectives and, um, and, and we'll attempt to connect them to Indigenous research and we'll also kind of go over or explain a little bit more of what Indigenous research methods is and I guess features of it, what it can look like. Um, so I, yes, I'm gonna start with this. This is, uh, these objectives were discussed and developed at this high level event that took place at the Los Pinos Cultural Complex within the Chapultepec Forest in Mexico City in the end of February in 2020. So, and hence that's the name of why I believe that they're calling it the Los Pinos Declaration making a decade of action for indigenous languages. Um, I included the site and where I found this or the, this information. Um, and I'm not gonna necessarily include all of the objectives. <laughs> um, I'm definitely included the ones that I felt pertain to language research and, and linguistics. Um, so yeah, just to put a disclaimer on that. Um, this document kind of starts out with this, with stating the principles uh, for enacting or promoting and implementing the objectives um, for the decade of action. Um, so it starts out with this key principle of nothing for us without us, um, focusing on the centrality of indigenous peoples. Uh, so to me that, that's already kind of aligns with what indigenous research is. Um, and I bolded the parts that reflected characteristics of an indigenous research approach, um, reflect the insights and values of indigenous peoples, their identities and traditional knowledge systems and cultures, and also the effective and inclusive participation of indigenous peoples in consultation, planning and implementation of processes from the start of any development initiative. Um, So the nothing for us without us is also, also aligns with another characteristic or feature that of indigenous research and that is, which is that of relational accountability. So this concept of relational accountability is discussed by um, 
I forget his exact affiliation, but First Nations scholar at Wilson, um, who 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 discusses it as a as an obligation in the research relationships, uh, being accountable to all of your relations. Um, so not necessarily just humans, uh, so people in communities, but also to their languages, to the environment, to the land, to the cosmos, and also to indigenous ideologies. So this concept of relational accountability is also discussed um, discussed in this recent chapter um, by scholars Fast and Kovac, um, and it is also framed as an obligation or responsibilities. For these scholars, these uh, this obligation means knowing community, knowing self, and being aware of practices that can impede upon or nourish the community researcher relationship. Um, so knowing community, they discuss this in terms of knowing protocols, um, community, community protocols, um, but also stressing that it's dependent on local context. So every, every community, every context might be different. Um, so they, they highlight the protocol of introducing oneself in indigenous context includes acknowledging relations. Um, so definitely, you know, within, in my experience, um, just to give a little bit more info about <laughs> my positionality, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. So I, you know, I didn't mention that my, my maternal grandparents moved from Zuni Pueblo to Denver, Colorado. So New Mexico and Colorado is just right kind of the next day on top of it. And it's about a 10 to 12 hour drive from Denver to Zuni. But my grand, my maternal grandparents um, relocated there in 1964, 1965. And this was part of a bigger, a bigger government, um, the Indian Relocation Act uh, and an assimilation policy uh, meant to, you know, get have government assistance to be able to move and obtain training, um, kind of vocational training, and live in urban cities. Um, so I, because of that, I grew up in Denver. I didn't grow up in Zuni. I grew up always going back and forth <laughs> in the summers, going for ceremonies, uh, both summer and winter. Um, so yes, there is definitely a noticeable kind of insider, I feel, an insider outsider feel when I go back to the reservation sometimes because why I look like I'm, like I'm obviously from there when I start talking, it's immediately known that I'm not necessarily from there because I don't have the accent. Um, but, and that's the case where I have to introduce myself. I had to learn how to introduce myself with, in Zuni, like acknowledging who my relatives are, like who my grandparents are. And, the, and that's, that kind of, I guess, gave me, or I guess credentials or made me legitimize my, my my status in some way is being able to do that. Um, so that that is the pro, an example of a protocol that it, you within a digital context you have to kind of acknowledge your relations um, of who you are in that community and who you, who who you're related to in that community. It's also you also kind of may, may see this in academic context too when indigenous scholars um, introduce themselves. They um, so they will include their kinship or clan um, or where they're from. So you also kind of saw an example of what I did um, with in terms of acknowledging the land, which is definitely in a protocol when it comes to indigenous research, a newer protocol, I, I, I would say, in definitely most contexts <laughs> now. Um, so yeah, it's also a common protocol in indigenous context, a fairly new practice in the US academic context, and that it's meant to acknowledge and make as many people aware, especially in the Americas, that this is all indigenous native land. 
Um, so yeah, the next one, knowing self is self-situating and sharing your story. Um, I exemplified that with me sharing my story kind of at the beginning and a little bit briefly um, before the, be, with the knowing community um, to help discuss and let others know about possible biases. Um, just definitely being that we're at, within digital research, there's that call for reflexivity and self-situating and also with that reflexivity also calls for sharing your story with your colleagues your, and your collaborators. So in this next part um, of being aware of practices that can impede upon or nourish the community researcher relationship, they discuss it in terms of an example that one of the scholars experienced at an academic conference um, where non-Indigenous scholars were on a panel discussing Indigenous communities. Um, they, these non-Indigenous scholars discussing non-Indigenous communities did not acknowledge their relationship to indigeneity or to any Indigenous person, peoples, oh, anyone in the community that they worked with. Um, So they, the, I think it was the, the scholar um, Fast, um, who viewed it as appropriation of indigenous knowledge um, of not making or not directly, especially at a, a conference of, and a, a, a conference that focus when the research focuses on indigenous peoples and communities, like not not stating how you became involved with that research or involved with that community. They felt they 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 felt viewed it as appropriation of indigenous knowledge, and also included that example in their chapter as a way to highlight the importance of being aware of research on indigenous peoples. Um, and and how, especially when in in the America. Native American context like that. How that has led to many, many scholars building their careers off of indigenous languages and cultures. Continuing on with the objectives. <laughs> um, so they, they break it down into major objectives and specific objectives. Um, their major objectives is to draw attention to the critical loss of indigenous languages and the urgent need to preserve, revitalize and promote indigenous languages and to take steps at the national and international levels. Um, and I wanna call attention to here to how preservation is viewed under language documentation and to language warriors because it's not the same <laughs> in my opinion, in my, in my experience. Uh, language preservation under language documentation means to archive is place those materials in, in an archive or repository. Um, preserve them in that sense. Uh, but language preservation to language warriors is synonymous to language realization is to keep the language alive, to keep it as a spoken language or re, yes, to keep it or reclaim it, build it back into a spoken language in some instances. Um, so I, I, I want to highlight that because that has always, you know, the revitalization, the preservation, when it comes to Indigenous languages, Indigenous language, and language warriors, they want, it's not about placing it in material or placing it in archives. Um, yeah. So I want to call attention to that important point, um, but I will move on now into attempt to uh, approach the connections 
or yeah, attempting to connect the specific objectives of the international decade of indigenous languages, indigenous research methods, and field linguistic training. Um, so I'm, I'm so I kind of well, I give a little brief description of kind of indigenous research and indigenous methods, and kind of give a distinction which has been discussed by Kovac um, primarily who states indigenous research involves and benefits indigenous peoples and methods are approaches based on indigenous knowledge. So I'm gonna approach this, these connections as the indigenous research involving and benefiting indigenous peoples. Um, so to me, an indigenous research approach to field linguistic training entails which is one of these suggestions, and I'm only gonna be focusing on one of these suggestions I propose in my paper, um, is a recognition of linguistics as a discipline rooted in colonizations and its implications for speakers, communities, uh, community members and community members. Um, and, and as field linguistics is connected to colonial first encounters with the exotic other. Um, this can be done through an explicit discussion of ethical concerns. Um, so as I mentioned, a major finding was that ethics were rarely discussed in, as I found um, with a text a really discussed in field linguistics training, but I feel it's definitely crucial to knowing the history of linguistic field research on indigenous peoples and how colon colonization has contributed to language shift. Um, this aligns with the major objective as to draw attention for, to the critical loss of indigenous languages. Um, this explicit discussion of ethical concerns also needs to focus on power relations. Um, this was like on the question, who gets to decide? And also I, I wanted at this time too, um, I don't know if it's possible, is to think, of to, as I'm going along with these, I definitely encourage you all to kind of think of how this, especially if you're an instructor or kind of a, a professor who, <laughs> who has the power to enact change in your department, <laughs> um, to think about how, how these indigenous research methods can be incorporated into your department into your field linguistic training. I don't know if it's possible if someone wants to create a Google Doc and uh, you know it could be a, a collaborative note-taking thing up to you all but I just thought I'd <laughs> encourage that and mention that to you all um, as I go along and obviously these are not I'm hoping they could be applicable, but you know, it's like, as I mentioned, it's going to be dependent on local context. Um, okay, so going back into, you know, this explicit discussion, um, focusing on power relations and the question who gets to decide, I'm going to talk about that in terms of three concepts. Um, terminology, approaches to language research and the expert. So terminology, the specifically when it comes to language names, my my suggestion, um, or definitely what needs to happen during the indigenous, the international decade, is re respecting the self determination of autonyms of of what communities want their language to be called, um, and also during field linguistic training, engaging with questions such as who decides which language name to use in publications, especially if there are multiple variants. Um, what are the so socio-historical contexts for these variations? Um, a lot of colonial names given to cultures and languages tend to be negative um, or have a negative connotation. Um, and those are definitely the names that we that academics use. Um, and there's not really much discussing discussion on on incorporating the autonyms as as a forefront or to be used in publications and or even kind of just discussing 
negative alternatives of 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 the of language names. So to me, this aligns with the specific objective of understanding the importance of indigenous perspectives and education systems. Um, but I'm, I'm also going to say educational efforts uh, because that's what language work is. Um, it may not always be based in the educational system. So the next concept um, in terms of power relation, who gets to decide is approaches to language research. So as I mentioned, one of my findings, a focus on language learning or in, in field linguistic courses, field linguistic training, uh, traditional el elicitation techniques are, are privileged or definitely heavily incorporated, heavily, that's what the focus is on, but definitely what, a recommended suggestion um, to, to incorporate additional, let's see, approaches um, to language research that, that it definitely needs to be a incorporation of applied um, language when it comes to the elicit, eliciting language. Um, so with that, you, you can focus on language learning topics to, you, to bring about traditional grammar topics. Um, I know that's going to, I've gotten pushback on that from my professors <laughs> um, in these courses and talking about it. Um, but it can be done. And I know it can be done because I've seen it at through the language immersion lessons that all the participants have given. Um, and so I included this quote um, from Crowley, uh, who stated that there's a need for the discipline to accord greater recognition to the value of applied as against purely theoretical and descriptive activity, activities in order for the contributions of indigenous linguists to be fully recognized. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the goals or one of the objectives for Natives for Linguistics are the expanding linguistic science by broadening Native American participation, which evolved into the Natives for Linguistics special interest group under the Linguistic Society of America. Um, you know, one of the objectives was to increase participation of indigenous uh, scholars into linguistics and at the LSA annual meeting. Um, in my experience, you know, native scholars do not feel comfortable at that meeting. <laughs> that it's not, it's not a safe space for them um, because the way that language is discussed. And, and while there are some efforts to incorporate, include more, you know, language revitalization, especially through one of the sister societies, SILA, the Society for, Sister Society of Indigenous Languages of America. Um, they, yeah, the LSA in terms of their annual meeting still has a lot of work to be done in, in the sense. Um, so to me, this aligns with, you know, taking short, medium and long-term actions to preserve, revitalize um, in order to ensure sustainability and longevity of indigenous languages after this decade and has ended. Um, and I think, you know, inc including this, applied language learning focus into especially field methods courses definitely needs to be a structural change for the discipline in order to meet this uh, meet this goal meet uh, help to meet this objective um, so this is also a way that I guess linguistics can provide access to sustainable, accessible, workable, and affordable indigenous knowledge records, because that is a way to, you know, focusing on language learning topics can produce some um, language and cultural materials. Um, and definitely the speaker collaborator should continue to have access to that um, after, you know, the their work with the course or the university has ended. Um, but definitely that's a goal <laughs> or, you know, that 
that has been my experience too. But then I also wanted to bring up a case, a recent case to where this to where universities can still be seen as gatekeepers, as academic gatekeepers um, and profiting off of indigenous languages and cultures. And this was a case, once again, from my home state um, in Colorado. Um, so Boulder's not too far from Denver. Um, so this is a recent case of CU Boulder and Lakota language and cultural materials. And this is the title of the, um, the news headline of, so after initially asking for payment, CU won't charge Lakota teacher for tribes language records. So this just came out last week. Um, so it's a local news article and I just put the link there if anybody wants to check it out. You can also Google it and it should come up. Um, okay, I know I'm, I'm going again. time. So the last, uh, the last uh, concept in terms of power relations who gets to decide is the expert. So this also includes knowing the history of research on indigenous peoples and how that has come to where non-indigenous peoples come to be known as the experts of those peoples. <laughs> and that is highly problematic. <laughs> and um, so definitely what needs to happen in field linguistics training, and I would say even just in linguistics programs in general, is so that there's a need to recognize that indigenous collaborators have their own expertise that they contribute to the research project um, within field methods courses or a kind of any effort that any course that involves a speaker collaborator, they should be acknowledged as an expert by noting the role as such on the syllabus. Um, and this is an additional inclusion, what I, which I didn't include, um, I didn't originally include in my paper, was, but especially with these objectives, um, made me think about it is incorporating training with a critical lens on an intellectual property, emphasizing how it applies to language documentation materials. Um, so this aligns with the specific objectives of promoting indigenous knowledge ex exchanges with science and research. But also, and also with supporting indigenous peoples and safeguarding their intangible heritage expressed through language. Um, so, definitely, intellectual property is not widely discussed in any linguistics program, in my experience, um, but it, it's an important and related to language records and materials. Um, and especially with the creation of more language records, how, how that could be, well, how intellectual property can be applied to that so that it's not appropriated as well. So my, my experience is that if there's only one <laughs> error, one venue that I know that that has kind of a just a brief, a brief overview of the of intellectual property, um, and that is through um, I've seen it done in, in through the Biennial Colang, the Institute on Collaborative Language Research, uh, by Dr. Uh, Susan Smythe Kong from UT Austin. She's kind of a the go-to person on asking questions about intellectual property uh, stuff. Once again, in my experience, so. Oh, great. Um, so I want to, I'm almost done. <laughs> I want to, I want, I want for us to kind of think Yeah, some of these objectives require thinking beyond field linguistics. Um, so, and I definitely want to highlight a major need for language warriors in terms of training. Um, in terms of skills needed. Um, and that is when, so the that's a building capacity beyond linguistic training and language materials, grant writing skills and support. Um, so these objectives, some of these specific adults for more funding, more funding resources, which is great. That's what's needed for language revitalization work. Um, as 
probably many of us of us know language documentation grants. Some specifically say they do not fund language revitalization activities. Um, so yeah, that's great. There, there's a need for more funding opportunities for more funding sources. Um, and hopefully with these more funding opportunities with people are getting more funding that this will eventually lead to training and employment opportunities. Um, so yeah, if there's going to be more grants available, developed, people, Indigenous, like, yeah, language warriors need to, de yes, they need to learn and develop skills in grant writing so that they, that they are able to write these grants on their own and not necessarily have to kind of rely on an outsider scholar um, to assist them with that. But, um, and this is a need or this is in my ex current experience, I am also currently involved um, with another NSF grant, um, strengthening capacity and dynam dynamic language infrastructure for tribal nations, um, in which this, this grant was specifically written and designed to create training opportunities and establish partnerships between members of Native American groups and linguists with grant experience in order to help increase submissions and successful awards in the language sciences for projects led by Native American principal investigators, PIs, and especially those based um, in Native American institutions. So that goes into supporting existing institutions already. Um, so I would also say that there's a need for major grants to allow, and this, this, this is my, my familiarity with some of the major documentation grants that there's a need for grants to allow indigenous collaborators to serve as the co-PI and be employed through the grant. Um, I know my, one of my colleagues at UCSB um, definitely received a prestigious language documentation grant and wanted to include their indigenous collaborator as the co-PI, but was told that if they were listed as the co-PI, that they could not be employed uh, through the same grant as well. So they, that indigenous co-PI wasn't able to be in a, a PI and had to just be in a sense demoted um, under the grant. Um, and but they're able to be listed as co-depositor. So that's that's an issue. Um, so I, I mean, I bring this up to encourage not just for linguistic training, but also kind of the linguistics discipline and to how, yeah, how our training um, can assist with the specific, especially these specific objectives for the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. And I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that is all I have. Um, I think I spoke almost the entire time. I'm sorry. No, that, that's great, uh, Adrian. Thanks for sharing. Uh, we'll take time for questions, and I mean, if you have time to go over the uh, the hour together, we can we can stay a little longer. If people have uh, questions, but that depends on your schedule. Uh, if anyone does have questions, you can use the hand raising function in Zoom. You could just put a Q in the chat to signal that you have a question. Well, you could write out your question in the chat if you'd rather um, I read it out for you. So do let me know if you have questions. While, while we wait for those to come in, Adrian, maybe I can start with the question that I imagine one of the immediate pushbacks you get on this kind of a topic of bringing in this emphasis on the ethics and the relational aspects of working with speakers of a language is that you're going to have a time problem in the classroom, right? There's only so much time. It's already a pretty challenging class, even if you're just focused on eliciting data and describing the morphosyntactic and phonological structures. That's already a pretty hard task for students. Now you're bringing more into it. Uh, how, do, how do you respond to that? What, what yeah, will probably most teachers of these kinds of courses will see as a practical challenge? So first, I'm definitely advocating just for the inclusion of knowing about community building relationships I do acknowledge that and I do am aware of the time constraints and yes that has been definitely the the pushback is that I don't have time there's no time to cover all those topics and definitely there you know 
so maybe there may not be time within that course, but students can still learn about that there is a need, that there is a way that these communities have discussed <laughs> community relationship building um, and that they should just know about it first. Like they should just learn about it. Like they don't need to try to implement it in that specific course, as if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so at minimum, I would, yeah. Actually, uh, raising awareness of the issues at minimum. Yeah, at, the, at minimum, it's just making people aware. I mean, I'm not, I am aware of that. And also when it comes to, especially as a grad student myself, um, you know, some of the objectives I wasn't able to, you are not objectives, but kind of some of the, the tenets of indigenous research, like, you know, involving everyone from the start and able, you know, having in everyone be involved in the research questions. That's not really something, well, I definitely wasn't able to do <laughs> as a grad student. It's kind of, I had to develop my own research questions, not necessarily with the support or guidance or feedback from community members mm -hmm. initially. And, and that's due to time as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can also ask another pedagogical question uh, about contextualizing linguistics as a field for students. It's, it's pretty easy to say, Linguistics has this colonial context it comes out of, and it's kind of everyone can sort of agree with that and repeat that mantra and feel like, okay, now we've accomplished decolonizing linguistics because we've all said the mantra, which I, I assume is not what anybody really wants to see happen. So I'm wondering how, how do you, or what do you recommend in terms of ways to help students, help linguists see and understand what it means for linguistics to come out of a colonial context and uh, besides just saying that that's the way it is. So how do you teach or how do you help people come not just to see the facts, but to become aware of what that means for linguistics to have come out of this colonial context? Are there particular references or books that you've that have been helpful for you? I don't know about text, but I guess just the way I, so I've been able to um, teach a couple just intro to linguistics course. I think that kind of Anissa started that, that kind of these discussions of helping students to kind of get a more in-depth of what linguistics really is. I, I think it really needs to start there. Um, and I, I think I kind of approach it as definitely, I was including ethics, like having with us, it's including the, or I guess in the American context, I have them look over the LSA, what's a code of ethics or statement of ethics. Um, And also kind of look at like kind of a different approaches to language research because the norm is just the kind of it's just on that quantitative that uh, language data and but then there's also different approaches to language research such as qualitative um and that you know, for socio cultural um linguistic research so to me that's that's at least giving a little bit more broader <laughs> view um and i guess for me i definitely try I, even just including, I know that just on acquisition, so including that there are, you know, within language acquisition, acquisition context of second language acquisition, that there's these, there's this language revitalization movement topic <laughs> discussion um, going on in various parts um, of the world. And yeah, that's, that's one way, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Hercules, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Hi. Thanks, Joey. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, good evening. I'm Hercules Singmunda from, I, I am currently pursuing MA at SOAS, and I, I belong to an indigenous community. And most of the things that you said were pretty much relatable, like rather it be naming of the language or working as a PI versus a consultant and a non-Indigenous scholar discussing about Indigenous knowledge. So my question to you is, uh, apart from academics and po policy, do you see any other means by which we language can be promoted? 
indigenous languages because uh, mostly it's the, the topic of indigenous languages comes across either academic or policy but we apart from that um, there's no discussion in other fields like media or technology hmm. to me i think that kind of includes more outreach or and definitely kind of more i guess to the communities themselves because maybe that could be something that they can assist with in terms of I guess more venues for awareness and more venues for promotion so I think if it's coming from them themselves and I like I said I would I, in my experience <laughs> that a lot of communities especially a lot of the tribal communities weren't aware of even just the international year um, and you know if I actually just Um, I met with one of my one of my students from she from Aldi on Monday, and she came to talk about grants, and that's also why you know she's like I need to learn, I need to know how to do this, so that's why I emphasize that. But I brought up the international decade, and she was like, oh well, like I didn't <laughs> like what is this like, and I was like use this like use this you know use what they're with these objectives and that it's supported by UNESCO like it's supposed to be like this global initiative like use that as as support or kind of affirmation to the your work you're doing and use it for you know especially for, to your tribal government like share this with your tribal leadership and that they, they need to be knowing about this too so i think like i just don't think a lot of people aren't a lot of people are aware of just this whole decade um beyond you know where we know about it in academia and everything too but if the community members don't know Yeah, I think that they first they need to be aware of it and that they can use that to promote, you know, develop, okay, how do we want, then that should be, you know, after they're made aware, hopefully after about bringing awareness that they can, that will lead into kind of, okay, how can we, how can we use this once again for our kind of sense, like how, for our benefit, like how can we make it specific to us? Um, and how can we become involved with it if they want to? Um. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, for the thanks, Adrian. Um, if, does anyone else have a question? I have one more question I could probably uh, end our discussion with, but uh, if anyone else has a question, I just want to give a chance. Adrian, one, one of the things you talked about was focusing on areas of linguistics that are more likely to be of interest or benefit to the speakers of the language that, that are being studied. But there's always going to be aspects of the research that are either not going to be of interest or not of any direct benefit to a particular community of speakers who happen to speak that language just because of the nature of the research or the research questions. Um, so would you say that linguists should generally just avoid those topics altogether? Or at what point does it become appropriate for a researcher working with who's an outsider, say working with a community to say, I want to do a project using, you know, data from your language that's not going to benefit you, that's probably not of interest to you. Now, is it just a matter of time and creating the right relationships and respect and reciprocity before doing that? Or should that kind of uh, uh, linguistic research that doesn't benefit the community sort of just be avoided altogether? I wouldn't say it needs to be avoided because uh, it's going to happen regardless. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, just being what you kind of, how, how you frame that was just, is being upfront about it, right? You're just like, I, that's stating your positionality and that's stating kind of where your approach to this. And I mean, that could be, I'm not sure how they would take it, but I feel like for me, that would just be like, just acknowledge your approach. Like just acknowledge, be, be, well, be real <laughs> in a sense of, 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 I guess, how you, how you approach research. Um, yeah, that may not be your, oh, you know, your alt, you know, your go-to approach all the time, but like you said, it may have to happen for some language research. And it's just like, okay, I think like even acknowledging that, like, and to the speaker or collaborators, whoever you're working with, but also acknowledging that in the actual work. Um, so that is probably something that has never been done or I've never really seen any kind of linguistics. It's just, 
acknowledging or just kind of like, okay, like I know this is kind of a purely theoretical um, approach and this may not have no immediate or may not be immediately applicable to the community or the speaker themselves. This was discussed with them. They know, <laughs> I don't know. That's to me, that's something in that way, I think is a way, a way to approach that is, is like you said, just how you approach it, just being real, um, stating your positionality and why you wanna approach that. Um, and I think also kind of including that in the actual research or even just discussing that in, in um, when presenting about it. Um, and it may not have like, I guess in the sense of what's, 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 benef what's beneficial in that sense of like, how, is there something from that research? Is there another skill from that research? Um, not necessarily linguistic analytical skills, but is there still something else that, another re um, transferable skill from that research that that uh, collaborator is able to gain from it? that could be useful for them, computer skills. I mean, so I'm kind of thinking of like that in terms of broader impacts trading and kind of how that could be. Uh, and just thinking about how, you know, that's something that we, Natives for Linguistics are advocating for is that when it comes to kind of silo presentations um, or presentations on indigenous languages presented at the LSAs that they include a broader impacts in their um, abstract. Um, and broader impacts can mean a variety of things, not necessarily just the production of language learning materials. Good, great. Well, thank you for sharing your perspective on that and for making the time to put this presentation together. Uh, we look forward to the paper coming out and I think that's going to continue to generate discussion and reflection as we think about how to be uh, better in, in teaching. Uh, the next generation of linguists, what it means to do research in collaboration with communities of speakers and signers all over the world. Thank you so much. I appreciate you inviting me and thank you everyone for attending and your questions. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you.